Well, welcome and thank you for tuning in to this interview with Dr. Craig Carter of Tyndale University College, where he serves as a professor of religious studies. Yesterday, Dr. Carter lectured here on the topic, Augustine and the Secular in Christendom and Modernity. It was a wonderful lecture that I do commend to you. That's also on the Henry Center website and trust that you'll have the chance to watch the full lecture as well. We'll speak briefly about it this morning, but it's very much worth your time to hear Dr. Carter speak at length. Dr. Carter, welcome to Trinity and to Trinity's Carl Henry Center for Theological Understanding. We're certainly glad to have you and grateful that you're here. Well, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Very good. Um, yesterday in your lecture, uh, the essence of it was that the church needs to recover an Augustinian orthodoxy in order to critique modernity. And you emphasize especially modernity in terms of the rise of what you called statism. Uh, and I wondered if you could briefly summarize the basic thrust of your lecture for the, the viewing audience today. Well, I'll, I'll give that a try. Um, the Augustinian theology that uh, is important has many elements, but two, the two most important elements, I think, are um, theological anthropology, um, his anti-Pelagian view, his uh, doctrine of original sin, and um, his eschatology, his philosophy of history, it's often called, um, because his philosophy of history prevents us, both of these things prevent us from falling into utopianism. Modernity, I think, is a Christian heresy. Um, it is a, a, a form of culture that has arisen on the, um, on the, uh, the ruins of, of medieval Christendom. And it has, um, it is a Christian heresy because it has a false view of God, a false view of the human person and of history. And each of these views is not completely unrelated to Christianity, but in fact a twisting or a distortion of, um, of the Christian doctrine, and therefore it's a heresy. Um, a heresy is something that is, uh, builds on a Christian teaching, takes a Christian teaching, but twists it uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that, um, that uh, interferes with the clarity of the gospel. So in those three ways, um, doctrine of God, uh, doctrine of man and doctrine of history, um, modernity is a Christian heresy. So essentially, the recovery of, of Augustine's thought is an attempt to, to correct this heresy. I, I think that all, all attempts to, um, to counter modernity that um, operate or begin from within modernity are doomed to failure. They, they need to go back to something that is prior to modernity, older and deeper and truer than modernity in order to correct modernity. Um, so the left-right battles within modernity are not always um, uh, very relevant. Um, they, they, um, they perpetuate modernity by, by simply uh, tweaking it or, or changing an aspect of it, but they don't call it into question in a fundamental way. Augustinian theology does call modernity into question in a fundamental way. Um, in modernity, out of, coming out of the Enlightenment, we have two great political economies, capitalism, which uh, embodies the ideal of freedom, and socialism, which embodies the ideal of equality. And these two ideologies have battled throughout the 19th century and early 20th century, and uh, with the fall of communism in, in the Berlin Wall in 1989, um, a lot of people think that uh, liberal democracy or capitalism has triumphed. But of course, that's not really true, um, because capitalism has only overcome socialism by taking much of the socialist critique of capitalism into itself. And, and so socialism has affected uh, capitalist countries in such a way that they have become um, welfare states. They have become, bureauc the bureaucratic welfare state is the result of a, uh, an attempt to synthesize the ideals of equality and, uh, and freedom. So this means that, um, that what is happening is that modernity, uh, w which is something bigger, in, bigger than and inclusive of capitalism and socialism, um, <clears throat> modernity is moving toward a, a consensus on political economy that is neither the defeat of socialism or the defeat of capitalism, but a 
a merging together of the two. And central in this, uh, in, in modernity's thinking at this point, is the state. Now, the state becomes the agent uh, by which um, equality and, and freedom are synthesized and becomes the, the agent by which uh, a, a, a progressive, increasingly good society is realized. And I believe that the, uh, the Pelagian assumption that we do not have original sin holding us back uh, is integral to the, the to modernity at this point because it's believed that we can create a society by by um, by reason by by technology and by bureaucracy and by specialization and by experts and so increasingly society is governed by experts by technocrats um, I think you also see the Augustinian philosophy of history denied because the uh, because it's assumed that that we are moving progressively towards something better all the time but there is no sharp break in history in the future anticipated where God will intervene and bring about the kingdom of God. Rather, it's ours to build step by step and gradually as we go along. Um, so I think that, that the recovery of Augustinian theology is, uh, is a way to, uh, to critique modernity at a more fundamental level than the church is used to doing. The church is used to assuming that modernity is inevitable, that it's real, that it's... Uh, um, unchallengeable, and then trying to find some place to stand within modernity from which to critique what it considers to be the worst excesses of modernity. And, and what I'm saying is that, that that strategy is inadequate and that we need to think more deeply about this and we need to go back to um, find some place to stand outside modernity from which we can critique it. Mm -hmm. Now, when I hear you, I, th I think I hear you saying that insofar as economics and politics are concerned, we still are operating from a system that's fundamentally modern as opposed to postmodern. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't believe that um, the term postmodern is very helpful because it, uh, what it suggests to me is that there was a period called before modernity and then there was a period called modernity and now we're in a third period that is beyond modernity that is no longer modernity um, and that just does not seem to be the case to me uh, it seems to me that the enlightenment ideals are continuing to work themselves out so I would call what we're in now something more like hyper modernity or um, late modernity or um, in many cases the modernity is running down, is running, going to seed, it's running itself into the ground in what we call postmodern relativism and, and uh, postmodern ideas about, um, um, postmodernism is essentially critique, it's essentially um, saying what's wrong with something it offers no positive alternative. And so until we get a positive alternative to modernity, I don't think we're really in a postmodern situation. And you're suggesting that at least in politics and economics, and obviously beyond that, the positive alternative is classical Augustinianism. Well, not only classical Augustinianism, but I guess what I'm saying is extremely controversial at this point and probably surprising to people who have read my book, uh, rethinking Christ and culture, but I think I'm saying in a very real sense that um, that there are some some elements of Christendom that um, can provide us with help going forward for envisioning a positive alternative to modernity. Um, I've been very critical of Christendom, and in the lecture yesterday I was critical of Christendom, but I changed the title of what I was critical to critical of to um, triumphalism. And I said that triumphalism is the perennial temptation of Christendom, uh, that Christendom often degenerates into triumphalism, um, that historically it did degenerate at many points into triumphalism, and it deserves the criticism that it gets. But I'm not willing to reduce all of Christendom and all of, it, all of what it tried to do to simply triumphalism. And I think perhaps if I've given that impression in, before in my book, then that's probably, uh, that's probably a fair critique of my book, that it, uh, that it um, is too one-sided and, and global in simply condemning Christendom. Um, uh, what, what put me onto that was, was to, when I noticed that a lot of people um, assume that many of the things that Christendom produced, they take them for granted as good things. Like, Christendom, for example, uh, created um, 
laws against infanticide. Okay, uh, the, the early Christians went to the garbage dumps of Rome. They picked up children who had been left there to die of exposure, adopted them, and raised them. Eventually, when Christians became more influential in the Roman Empire, laws against infanticide were passed. And for 1,500 years, we've had laws against infanticide. Now, a, lo a lot of people just assume that um, laws against infanticide are a good thing, and, and that's fine. But that's a result of Christendom. Now, on the other hand, we see um, other laws that have come into Western culture as a result of Christendom that are being challenged by atheists and secularists. And when those laws get challenged, like abortion or marriage and divorce laws or whatever, um, when there's a strong secular uh, antipathy toward a given law, and Christians try to speak up and defend that law, they are accused of being Constantinian or accused of defending Christendom. And so Christendom, the way it works rhetorically is that it becomes a way of putting down anybody who speaks up for laws that are simply just and humane, but which happen to be, which happen to be championed by Christians. Well, that seems perverse to me. That, that seems like a problem. Why would we... Why would we want to assume that everything Christendom did was wrong? Why would we assume that one day of rest out of seven is a bad thing for working people, for, for families, for, for society as a whole? Why would we think that, uh, that it's bad? And, 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 and of course, people don't think that a lot of these things are bad until they're challenged. But once they're challenged and, and there's any attempt to defend them, even if the attempt to defend these laws are, is made on the basis of natural law and reason and, and so on, and not even with, by, via an appeal to revelation, um, it's still considered Constantinian and defending Christendom to defend such laws. So I, I think that's problematic. I think what that, what that shows is that Christendom had a lot of good points and that the kind of society that existed in the high Middle Ages was in many ways a good society. Um, was it a perfect society? Of course not. Um, can it be criticized? Of course. And, and did it degenerate in certain areas into violence and coercion and church dominate, dominating culture and dominating the state? Yes, and all those things are to be rejected. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing there to build from. And I guess that's, I guess I, I'm worried by the fact that we, we want to be postmodern. We, we admit that there's something wrong with modernity, but we think that our entire past is totally closed off to us. We think that everything prior to modernity is just to be rejected, just evil, just bad, just something that we can't have anything to do with. Well, where does that leave us? If our entire past is unusable, if the current situation is untenable, um, as that sounds like a recipe for despair and nihilism to me. I want to shift gears just a second because, in a way, you are the perfect sort of speaker for this scripture and ministry series for the Henry Center because our goal has always been to bring together the academy on the one hand and the local church and the pastor in the local church on the other. And of course, not only do you teach in the academy, but in your local Baptist church, you serve as theologian in residence and you preach on a regular basis, as I understand it. And so one of the questions I have that I think, because a lot of pastors will watch this interview, uh, that's, a, that's one of our goals. One of the questions I have for you because of your uh, unique situation is, how would you counsel pastors preaching week in and week out to deal with political issues or to stay away from political issues since you preach regularly and I'm sure deal with some of this in your own preaching. Um, well, I do deal with, uh, with political issues in my preaching, but really I think more accurately I would say I deal with moral issues. Um, Maybe uh, a lot of people might not find this a meaningful distinction, but I think you can distinguish between the church having something to say about the morality of an issue, what's right, what's wrong, versus the church getting involved in partisan politics. And by partisan, I mean taking a general position in favor of a certain political party and accepting the good and the bad and just simply... Um, being a partisan for that political position. 
I don't, I don't think that's the role of the pastor uh, of the local church. I think that it may be, well be the role of individual Christians as they are led by the Lord in that, you know, to perhaps join political parties and, and do that sort of thing. But in the preaching from the pulpit, I think that the pastor needs to constantly ask himself, am I, am I, am I wading into this issue in a partisan way or am I, am I trying to give moral instruction? If you think of, if you think of your role as being to preach the Word of God. Expository preaching is the center of your, of your attention and focus. That's what you're there to do. All right, if I, as I expound the Word of God, I can help people to form, I can help form their, their conscience, their, their moral outlook, and I can uh, bring to bear what the Word of God has to say on, on moral issues facing us. Now, in some cases, uh, once you do that, you will find yourself quickly accused of taking a partisan position right. because uh, it, it inevitably happens that um, in some cases it's such a black and white hot topic that uh, one side is for, one side is against. And the minute you say what the Bible teaches on that, you're identified with one side is over against the other. I don't see any help for that. Um, I, 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 there's just no way around that. But. I still think that it's important that in our minds as pastors, we, we come at this saying, what is right and wrong? What does the gospel say about this? What does the Bible say about this? How do we understand the word of God in this situation for this issue? And, um, and that's where we should be heading and, and what we're, we should be trying to do. <clears throat> and also, the second thing I would say about that is that when we preach, um, uh, it's always, I always work in series. I'm preaching through the Lord's Prayer at the moment. Um, I, I don't usually read the newspaper and, and decide what I should preach on next Sunday as a result of the current event that's going on. Um, it, it's important to try and form people morally, form our congregations morally um, over a period of time um, helping them to understand moral issues in the light of biblical theology um, rather than writing to the rescue at the last moment when there's a political decision imminent that's going, that has to be where you have to take sides and call your MP and write a letter or whatever, that type of thing. Um, I think the long-term moral formation of the congregation is important, but the pastor cannot neglect that. The, that's a very important thing. I do think that on the issue of politics, when we evangelicals talked about, talk about politics, we usually are talking about issues. And um, both in the um, teaching in the academy and also in the preaching of the church, I don't think we spend enough time thinking about what we might call political theory or, or general philosophical approaches to politics and economics. We, we, are, are, we tend to focus on issues and um, instead of theory, and that's, uh, that's somewhat problematic because I, I think that we, we are not thinking deeply enough um, uh, about the, the foundations of certain issues, like what is the role of government? Uh, what, what is the role of the church vis-a-vis -vis government? Um, what, what is the role of the Christian citizen? Um, what, um, you know, how do Christians look at the French Revolution? Is the French Revolution, are the French Revolutions and the English Revolution, the American Revolution, are they all talking about liberty in exactly the same way? Do they all mean the same thing when they talk about liberty? Well, the answer, of course, is no, but, but that's the kind of thing we need to think about and, and talk about and educate our people about. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're talking about through the preaching, faithful preaching to the Word, inculcating within the congregation their minds and hearts a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview. Yes, I, w I would say that. I, I don't talk that much about worldview because I find that the worldview language in the, in the, the uh, Coun Council of Christian Colleges and Universities, um, you know, that we're a part of, um, very often the worldview language is a kind of a very stripped down, uh, abstracted kind of systematic theology. Mm -hmm. It's a, a very bare bones kind of systematic theology. Um, but I do think that, uh, that uh, it, and it needs to be more robust and, and more biblical um, is my point, but, but I do think that, um, that that's what we're doing. We're trying to form a Christian worldview. Um, who am I? Where am I? 
what's wrong and what's the solution. Those are the, you know, and NT writes helpful addition. What time is it? These are the uh, basic worldview questions. Yes, this, this, this is what we're trying to do in our preaching and, and helping our congregations to develop a, a Christian worldview uh, it's very important. Like, for example, right now, what I'm doing in my local church is on Sunday mornings, I'm teaching an eight-week Sunday school class on children's literature, of all things. Um, it's, um, I'm using a book called A Landscape with Dragons, written by uh, a Catholic novelist and artist, Michael O'Brien. It's an excellent book. Um, it talks about how children's literature has changed in the past 30 years as the cultural worldview has changed. And the, with the influence of Eastern thought on Western thought through the New Age movement, and with the uh, breakdown of a, a clear set of ideas about good and evil, and how the symbols in, in literature have, been, have changed. For his, his main example is the symbol of the dragon. And uh, dragons have become pets and, uh, and friends and mentors in many children's books these days. And he talks about what's wrong with that kind of symbol inversion and, and, and failure to, to, to root oneself in the symbolic universe that has developed in English literature over, over centuries. Um, and I'm doing this because um, in my church we have many young families and the children bring home from school the scholastic book orders and they want to buy books, and what parent wants to say no to a child who wants to buy books and read them, but you don't know what these books are like, how can you, how do you tell? And so my basic message to parents is, well, let's get together and help each other here. And what we're going to do in our church is to, um, at the end of this course, there's going to be a book review form that's going to be created. And everybody who's taken the course and read the, the O'Brien book is going to get this book review form. And we are going to um, have parents reviewing books and then sharing their reviews uh, with the rest of us in some kind of form, probably on our church website. And the forms will actually, um, in, actually give the, the parent who's doing the review a chance to, to explain what is the worldview in this book. And, and is it Christian, is it not? We want to get beyond just looking for bad words or sex scenes. We want yeah. to get to the point of saying, what worldview is being communicated in this book? And then depending on the age level of the child, you know, uh, there will be uh, recommendations and so on. And then, so our church library will have these and it will be on our website and uh, parents will stand a fighting chance of, of uh, being able to have some idea of which books to say yes to and which to say no to. And then of course, in, in addition to that, we'll be creating uh, bibliographies. There's a good one in O'Brien, there's others in our library and providing good classic children's classic. literature so that, you know, encouraging parents to, to um, because I say in my course, one thing, it is, it is appropriate to censor books, yes, especially with younger children, but it's more important even to give them good classic Christian literature or in Christian inspired literature, even literature that isn't overtly Christian but is from a, a basic Western Christian worldview. Um, very important. So that's an example of yeah. practical worldview teaching. That's, that's, that's helpful. That's helpful. I suppose we've come a long way since Robert McCloskey and Make Way for Ducklings, haven't we? <laughs> well, yeah, we've in come terms along. of <laughs> Today terms it's R.L. Stein literature. and vampires and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Golden Compass. Mm -hmm. One of the things um, I think our viewers would be interested in hearing about, and you alluded to this a bit, in the lecture yesterday, is your own journey over the last five years, um, politically, perhaps a bit theologically as well. Could you describe that journey simply as a sort of a, a personal testimony in, in that way? Yes, I jokingly said in the lecture, well, semi-jokingly, that uh, I could have called the lecture how I lost my faith in social justice. And uh, I love saying that to people because it's provocative and it, uh, of course, raises the issue of what is social justice and that opens up the discussion in an interesting way. Um, I've all, I, I was raised in a, in a conservative environment, fundamentalist, independent Baptist church, later went to a slightly more um, uh, open um, Baptist denomination. Currently I'm in a Baptist church that is part of a denomination that would be roughly something like the Southern Baptist uh, in, in American contact. Um, 
but for a long time, I, I had understood myself to be theologically conservative and politically liberal. And by that, uh, I meant politically in terms of politics and economics. Influenced early by, by Ron Sider's Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, um, then by Jim Wallace and Sojourners. And um, I, I responded to the call for the church to become involved in the issue of poverty. Um, that poverty is an important issue, that we should be involved in, in that. Over the years, as I've been watching um, the things develop, there has been a shift away from the church and charity and helping the poor personally towards a, being concerned about the poor, meaning to endorse a left-wing political vision where the state uh, redistributes income and, and engages in social engineering and social leveling so as to, to uh, bring the poor and the rich closer together in terms of economic equality. And I think that um, at a certain point in time, it, it gradually began to dawn on me that um, while I am absolutely supportive of and believe in the Bible's injunctions to care about the poor and to uh, care about uh, helping people who lack the basic necessities and how that this is a major requirement and a major uh, uh, function of the Christian community. Um, the political agenda that is endorsed very often by people who, who have this concern uh, is inconsistent with, uh, with Christian faith. The, the whole, what I call the statist agenda that I described earlier, this merging of capitalism and socialism to the point where the, the bureaucratic state becomes more and more pervasive and controls more and more of life and the management and, and running of the state is left act to experts and where civil society shrinks and, and withers away and the family becomes less and less important so that everything, all that's left is just the state and, and a mass of of individuals with little connection to one another. And it seems to me that the more we move in that direction, the more we move toward tyranny. And so um, helping the poor shouldn't result in tyranny. Okay, so if, uh, so that's the basic break that has occurred in my, in my thinking, um, is that um, I now no longer automatically reflexively assume that just because someone is concerned about poverty, concerned about helping the poor, concerned about a Christian witness in this area, concerned about the church being involved in that, that we automatically assume they're also in, uh, supportive of left-wing politics and, and supportive of socialism if possible, or at least the bureaucratic welfare state if, uh, if, if outright socialism isn't possible. Uh, that this is a, some, an assumption I no, lo no longer hold. Um, it, theologically, um, I've never really changed a whole lot theologically. I have questioned a lot of things, but over the last five years I've come to, um, to be more um, more and more conservative, um, which me, for me simply means reverting to the beliefs I've always held and for a period of time maybe question, but then have circled back and, 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 and stood in the same place as before. Um, yeah, so on a number of issues that, that uh, I could mention, um, I, would be, uh, I would probably be a little more conservative today than I was five or ten years ago. Um, yeah. As you look at passages like Romans 13 and read Augustine in the City of God and so forth, what do you perceive to be the proper role for government? I think government is uh, a necessity in a fallen world. I think it's part of the secular age that will wither away. I, I believe that uh, in the new heavens and new earth that God will rule directly and there will be, uh, uh, there may be roles for, um, for what we might call administration. Human beings will be involved in, in administration in the kingdom. But the state as we know it, which means um, uh, a monopoly on coercive force ruling over um, a, a territory will will not exist. Um, so, um, so the state is something that uh, Christians, uh, Augustine, I think, and the New Testament are, are very, very similar in their perspective on the state. Uh, sometimes the state is helpful. Um, it has a tendency to get out of control. It has a tendency to overstep its bounds. It has a tendency to become demonic. Um, 
therefore, one of the glories of the Western tradition is the whole idea of the limited state, the whole concept that the state doesn't rule everything and every area of life and every aspect of life, that there's a sphere of life where individuals and families and churches and other civic organizations um, and associations can have their autonomy and their own being and reality um, beyond the reach of the state. You know, this does not happen in Islam. This, this did not happen in the Soviet Union. It does not happen in contemporary China. This is, a West, this is something that, is, that has developed in, out of Western civilization, and I believe it is uh, uh, biblical. So the limited state, which is kept on a short leash and uh, which is um, uh, not in control of all of life, that, that's basically the biblical view. And the, and the state's going to take many different forms, and that's not really within the Christian, uh, within the Christian um, uh, ability to determine. Um, I don't really see a theory of the state in the New Testament. I don't see the state providing us with a blueprint for a republican or a democratic or a monarchy or a... I think Christians have to just take what state exists as it is and try to work towards limiting it and um, getting it to be modest and make sure that the people who are running the state uh, don't confuse what they're doing with, uh, with what God is doing and don't confuse God with themselves. I mean, I think that's the, the most important thing. There's so much more to ask, Dr. Carter. Your work on the theologian John Howard Yoder and your critique of Niebuhr's Christ and Culture, uh, two of your, your books. So I wonder if, as we close, if perhaps you might give a brief advertisement uh, for your blog site, for your website, and direct the listeners to this uh, video clip to where they might find more information about your thinking. Right. Well, I do blog at uh, The Politics of the Cross Resurrected. Um, and uh, on that blog, I address issues of politics and, and theology and current events and just... Uh, I um, have some things to say about those those issues. Um, my work on Yoder has uh, has been uh, something that has helped me to uh, uh, immensely in understanding um, a lot of these political and social issues. Um, the conflict between Yoder and uh, Niebuhr and then the appropriation of Yoder's work in Hauerwas is, um, is important for understanding contemporary social ethics. And then the relationship between Hauerwas and Milbank, I think, is crucial. Um, I think we need to be uh, reading Milbank, O'Donovan, Yoder, Hauerwas, Niebuhr, um, in, um, and the Catholic uh, social tradition as well in order to uh, have an understanding of 20th century Christian social ethics. So, uh, yeah, I, I try to engage those things on my blog. And um, in the future, I hope to write on uh, uh, another book um, on the same area as Rethinking Christ and Culture, but uh, hopefully a better book and a more Augustinian book. <laughs> well, we're so grateful to you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.